If you have your Bibles this morning, go to Deuteronomy 33. Sometimes when I'm going through a series or going through a book, you know, there's certain places that as I look at it, I think, okay, this will be easy to deal with. This will be easy to preach on. There's a lot of material here. And then all of a sudden you hit the stretch and you think, what in the world am I going to do with this? And um, that was sort of the case with the verse we're going to look at today. But, you know, as is the case with so many things in the Bible, once you start looking at it, a whole plethora of things just begin to come out of it. Deuteronomy 33, verse 1, it says, And this is the blessing. So that's what this chapter is all about. This is the blessing wherewith Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. We are right now in verse 22. Just a short verse. And of Dan, he said, Dan is a lion's whelp. He shall leap from Bashan. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the privilege of being here this morning. We thank you for everyone that's come. We thank you, Lord, for the songs that we've sung. And God, just that we can rejoice in you. And uh, Lord, now we're going to look at this verse. We're going to consider some thoughts. And Lord, you alone know um, the needs and you know what you want to plant in someone's heart. We pray in Jesus' name, God, that you would do your will, that you would be pleased, Lord, that you would do what we couldn't even think of doing. God, help us, Lord, this morning as we look at your book. Uh, Help us against every distraction, against every distracting thought, Lord, against every devilish thing that would work against the service this morning. And we pray that the seed of the Word of God would not be stolen out of the hearts when we leave. God, that you would bless your Word in Jesus' name. Amen. Deuteronomy 33, verse 22. And of Dan, he said, Dan is a lion's whelp. He shall leap from Bashan. It is a strange blessing, and there is some mystery connected to it. But as you begin to look at the Scripture, a whole uh, picture begins to emerge. This blessing seems sort of vague, and it is a very brief statement. And uh, you might think that this is another reference to military might, because we've We've noticed that with a couple of the other tribes, the Lord, um, you know, made mention of of how he would help them in battle. And so you you look at this and you think, well, well, maybe maybe that's what this is. But is it really? It sort of reminds us, this verse does, of another statement that shows up in Genesis 10. And you don't need to turn there. You can look it up whenever you want. But in Genesis 10, 8 you have a statement about one of Noah's grandsons. And Genesis 10 is all about what happened after the flood and how the earth was resettled after the flood and how uh, Noah's sons, you know, they sort of went here and there. And it tells us about the beginnings of the nations. That's what Genesis 10 tells us about. But as you go down through Genesis 10, and it's talking about the sons of Ham and Shem and Japheth, You have the listing of the sons of Ham, and one of the sons of Ham is a man named Cush, and then a man named Nimrod is mentioned. And in Genesis 10.8, all of a sudden, you find this descriptive statement. It says, And Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. Now you read that, and uh, you know you can just pass over it, but you do have to wonder, why did the Lord say that? Obviously, if the Lord said it, it's very significant. But He doesn't say it about anybody else. He, this chapter is not about hunters. It's not about trophy hunters and guys with racks on their walls. And uh, This chapter is about the earth being settled after the flood. And it mentions this man named Nimrod. And it seems like an innocent enough statement, provided he was just hunting animals. But as you read this brief statement about Nimrod, you notice something very significant. And again, I'm I'm connecting this to Dan because Dan's statement is very brief. But it's very significant. 
Um, in the records of antiquity, that's, you know, real, real ancient, ancient history records that they've unearthed, there are references to the man Nimrod. And nobody in antiquity has anything good to say about him, whether it's Josephus or whether it's Alexander Hislop and the two Babylons or some of these other guys. Antiquity says that he was evil and terrible and he was so evil that he almost had no rival and he would fit in real well with some of the craziness that's going on today. But the Lord doesn't mention that. Isn't that interesting? The Lord doesn't mention all his shenanigans. The Lord doesn't shy away from mentioning that with other people. But in Genesis 10, he doesn't say anything about that. He just makes a brief statement. And then in the next verse, he talks about what came out of Nimrod. It says, and the beginnings of his kingdom was Babel and then Nineveh. And you see he had a king, he was a king, he was over a kingdom, and you see that he was the founder of the Assyrians. And nothing good came out of Nimrod. So in Deuteronomy 33:22, we have another brief statement. And it seems innocent enough. But when you look a little closer, it is not at all what it appears to be. Look at Genesis 49. Keep your place there in Deuteronomy Look at Genesis 49. And this is where the 12 sons of Jacob are standing in front of him. And he's about to die. And he's blessing them directly. Genesis 49, verse 16. Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. And that was at least partially fulfilled in Samson. Because Samson was from the tribe of Dan. And he judged Israel quite a number of years. Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. And then he says, Dan shall be a serpent by the way. An adder in the path. An adder was a, a deadly, venomous snake in that part of the world. An adder in the path that biteth the horse's heels, the horse heels, so that his rider shall fall backward. I have waited for thy salvation, O Lord. These statements actually speak evil of the tribe of Dan, and they prophesy and predict evil of the tribe of Dan, and um, it's something that seems to show up um, all through the scriptures. You're there in Genesis 49. Go back to Genesis 46. Now, when I say that, you know, I'm, I'm not just making an assumption, so we're, we're going to try to prove that to you. He says, Dan will be a serpent. And Dan will be a lion. Look at Genesis 46, verse 8. And these are the names of the children of Israel which came into Egypt. Jacob and his sons. Reuben, Jacob's firstborn. And the sons of Reuben. Hanok and Phalu and Hezron and Carmi. And the sons of Simeon. Jemuel and Jamin and Ohad and Jachin and Zohar and Shehu, the son of a Canaanite woman, and the sons of Levi, Gershon, Kohath, Merari. And he just continues through, and he gives the name of each one of Jacob's sons, and then he gave the sons of all those guys that came out of them. But um, you notice that as we go through the list, and we just looked at a few that all Jacob's grandsons are specifically named. But then you hit verse 23. And the sons of Dan, Hushim. You say what's, what's important about that? Well, look at, the, look at the 
That word is plural, and the sons of Dan. But he only mentions one. Why are not the rest named? Go to Numbers 26. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. The Lord is strangely silent about the descendants of Dan. Look at Numbers 26, and it's even more obvious in this passage. Numbers 26, verse 1. And it came to pass after the plague that the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Eleazar the son of Aaron the priest, saying, Take the sum of all the congregation of the children of Israel from twenty years old and upward throughout their father's house, all that are able to go to war in Israel. So he begins to, uh, he's going to start naming um, the children of Israel, and he gets very detailed. Look at verse 5. Reuben, the eldest son of Israel, the children of Reuben, Hanok, of whom cometh the family of the Hanakites, of Palu, the family of the Paluites, of Hezron, the family of the Hezronites, of Carmi, the family of the Carmites. These are the families of the Reubenites. And they that were numbered of them were, and he gives the number. Look at verse 12. The sons of Reuben after their families, of Nemuel, the family of the Nemuelites, of Jamin, the family of the Jamanites, of Jacob, the family of the Jaconites, of Zerah, the family of the Zarhites, of Sheul, the family of the Sheulites. These are the families of the Simeonites, 20 and 2,000 and 200. And he keeps on down going. And then you hit Dan in verse 42. These are the sons of Dan after their families. Of Shuham, the family of the Shuhamites, these are the families of Dan after their families. All the families of the Shuhamites, according to those that were numbered them. You know, there's something odd about that statement. First of all, again, these are the sons, but he only names the one. Um, a lot of folks believe that... Um, this person in this text, Shuham, and in Genesis, Genesis it was Husham, they believe they're the same guy. And that often happens in Scripture. For example, um, King Azariah was also called King Uzziah. Peter was also called Cephas. It's just like a lot of you guys. You have your family name, and you have a first name, and you have a second name. I got a friend, um, one of my sons is visiting uh, far away, and he's um, uh, with an old friend of mine. And um, back in the day, when I first met this guy, everybody called him Larry. And um, and now nobody, if you go into that that neighborhood and you ask for Larry, nobody knows who Larry is. But they know who Joe is. Friend I went to Bible school with, and I told stories about him uh, at Teen Hurricane. Um, when I knew him, he was Kevin. Everybody knew him, called him Kevin. Well, when he moved, he decided to try out his middle name. And so everybody after that knew him as Derek. But it's the same guy. The Bible does that. Um, you, uh, you have this guy, and only one son is mentioned, but it says sons. In the other tribes in this chapter, he names the descendants of each son as a family singular. And then once he names all the sons, he talks about the families. But here he only names one son, and he talks about the families. With Dan, there are obviously several family lines, but the other sons are not named. One man that wrote about this passage said, the hiding of the names of Dan's children is the first indication of the silent blotting out of his name, which meets us later on in the total omission of this tribe from the genealogies 
recorded in First Chronicles 2 through 10. You know, you guys are reading your Bible through, you always hit the Chronicles, you know, and so-and-so begat so-and-so begat so-and-so and begat so-and-so. And you got about, you know, eight chapters of that, nine chapters of that. And it's interesting, by the time you hit First Chronicles, that's detailed list. But Dan is not mentioned. Neither is he mentioned in Revelation 7. where no mention is made of any being sealed out of the tribe of Dan. And I quote, There seems to have been an unwillingness on the part of the Holy Ghost to even mention this tribe by name. Also, wherever the names of all the tribes are given, Dan is usually far down on the list and often mentioned last. In Numbers 10, it says this. It begins to describe what happens when they blow the trumpets and how the camp will take down their tents and move on their journeys. And it says, And the standard of the camp of the children of Dan set forward, which was the rearward of all the camps throughout the host. The rearward is the guys that bring up the rear. Also, Dan was the last of the tribes to receive their inheritance when Joshua divided up the land in Joshua 19 and has very little to say about it. In these prophecies of Jacob, Jacob says he'll be like an adder. He'll be a serpent. And Moses says he'll be a young lion. You have those two descriptions. And the serpent and the adder, the first description, are the picture of something treacherous and deadly. Look with me, if you would, at a couple places. Look at Psalm 58. There again, you know, um, uh, you don't have to, I mean, I, I, mean you, I read stuff, I read people's commentaries, I, you know, and, and you guys do too, and there's nothing wrong with that. But ultimately, the Bible is its own best dictionary, and it's its own best commentary. So if you keep reading, and that's the benefit of reading from cover to cover and reading all of the Bible, is as you read it, and then you read it again, and you read it again, you start seeing how the Lord ties things together. Psalm 58, verse 3. He's talking about the wicked. The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies. Their poison is like the poison of a serpent. They are like the deaf adder that stoppeth her ear, which will not hearken to the voice of charmers, charming never so wisely. You know, you've seen those, you know, you've probably seen it, you know, the guy that has the basket and there's cobras in the basket, you know, and he's sitting in front of there and he's playing the, the little flute. And they say that the, the cobra actually is not hearing that flute. The cobra is deaf. And the swaying of the cobra is following the, the way the guy is moving his, his little flute. But God says the adder would not be safe and would never be charmed. Look at Proverbs 23. What's Dan like? He's an adder. Proverbs 23. Now we're going somewhere with all this, so try to try to stay with us here. Proverbs 23. Proverbs 23, verse 31. Proverbs 23, verse 31. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. At the last. It biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. You know, the Lord has nothing good to say. Uh, you know, you, uh, you find that in the garden, the serpent was more subtle than any beast in the field. And, and, um, and of course, the serpent was Satan. Da Dan would be a serpent, by the way, an adder in the path. The thought is, you know, that serpent, that deadly snake is waiting beside the path. It's waiting in the path. 
It's looking to to bite the horse's heels. It's looking to bring the rider crashing down, to take him by surprise, to throw him head over heels. Dan would be an adder. But Dan would also be a lion. He would be a lion's whelp. In other words, a young lion. The lion is the picture of strength. You know, you you, uh, no doubt have seen the... the, uh, um, the documentaries, you know, or the, those educational things, and it'll, you know, be showing this, the lions, you know, the African lions out in the jungle and all that. And, you know, you never see a lion that looks stressed. They just never do. I mean, they are the picture of strength. They are the picture of the animal that fears no challenge. He is called the king of the jungle. And he is known for his ability to leap. A man that was uh, lived over in Africa and was very, um, very familiar with the guides that would take the guys in the lion hunts. He said, every lion hunter that has ever been killed, and there's been a bunch of them. He said, every lion hunter that ever got killed, he said, what got him killed was, they didn't think the lion could leap that far. He is a young lion, and God said he will leap from Bashan. It speaks of ambush. And if you know your Bible right away, you could say, well, you know, couldn't, couldn't the lion be a good thing? You know, after all, Revelation 5, verse 5, Jesus Christ is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Man, he is the picture of power and strength. He is the king of kings and Lord of lords. All power is given unto him in heaven and on earth. And that's true. But Satan is also called a lion in scripture in 1 Peter 5. And it says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And, and the devil is also called a king. You know, the devil is the, the imitation of Jesus Christ. He is a king over all the children of pride. He is the, the God of this world. Small g, he's the, he's the God of this world. The devil took Jesus Christ into an exceeding high mountain and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And he said, all this power... The devil said this to the Jesus Christ, all this power will I give thee. See, the devil ruled the world. And God had given him that power. And he's still the God, small g, of this world. And he said to Jesus, he said, I'm, I'm the king of this world. He said, if you'll fall down and worship me, I'll give you power. In Isaiah 14, when Satan is kicked out of heaven, the Lord looks at him and he said, one of the reasons that you're, you're going to be cast down is in your heart, you said, I will exalt my throne, my throne above the stars of God. Daniel, excuse me, Dan would be a serpent and a lion. Is there any way that could be a good thing? Look at Psalm 91. Psalm 91 is a famous chapter, and it talks about how the Lord um, shadows the people that love Him, how He protects them, how He is with them in untold evil and untold evil situations, and how the Lord personally takes responsibility to protect His children. And so you come to verse 9, Psalm 91, verse 9, and the Lord says something. He says, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high, thy habitation, there shall no evil befall thee. Neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. But watch the next verse. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder. Boy, isn't it interesting the Lord puts both of those together. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder. 
The young lion and the dragon shall fell trample under feet. You know, the lion and the adder in Scripture are an evil pair. And this is the tribe of Dan. The serpent, deadly, poisonous, waiting, treacherous. The, the lion suggesting the hunt and the surprise and the ambush. Dan would be a traitor to his people and a traitor to the Lord. You come into Judges 18 and you don't have to turn there. But in the book of Judges, you know, you get that vicious cycle going of, of the children of Israel. Uh, they serve the Lord for a while under a good guy. The good guy dies and, um, and then they drift away and they go into worshiping idols. And then God judges them and brings them into slavery. And then they realize their mistake and they cry out to God and he raises up another guy. And those guys were called judges. And he raised up another guy to help them and to deliver them. And you go through that cycle all through the book of Judges. When you get towards the end of the book of Judges, you have the first detailed account of one of the tribes taking up idols. This tribe had abandoned the true God. And you know which tribe it was? It was the tribe of Dan. Many years later, you have King Solomon. King Solomon dies, and his son Rehoboam takes the throne, and Jeroboam challenges him because Solomon had really gotten very heavy-handed in his leadership and was taxing the people to death. And ten of the tribes sided with Jeroboam and said, if you'll just back off on the taxes a little bit, we'll, we'll, we'll follow you. And Rehoboam, you know, met with the young guys and he met with the old guys and, and Rehoboam decided to flex his muscles and said, no, you'll do as I say. And Jeroboam and the ten tribes split off of the kingdom of Israel and they never, ever did get unified again. But when that happened, Jeroboam, in his insecurity, he knew that the children of Israel three times in the year were supposed to go back to Jerusalem. And Jerusalem was in Judah. That was Rehoboam's kingdom. Under the law, three times in the year, they were supposed to present themselves in Jerusalem. Well, Jeroboam got thinking. He thought, man, if I do that, I might lose a bunch of my people. So Jeroboam decides to set up two golden calves. And boy, isn't that interesting how history repeats itself. I mean, you have Moses on the, the Mount Sinai. And, and what do they do as soon as they give up on Moses? They turn to a golden calf. And here it is again, but this time it's two. And Jeroboam sets up one calf in Bethel and one in Dan. And those calves became a fixture until the day that they were carried into captivity. Look at Deuteronomy 33 with me again just for a moment. Deuteronomy 33. We're going to look there, and then we're going to look at a verse, in the, a few verses in the Psalms. Look at Deuteronomy 33. Look at our verse, Deuteronomy 33, verse 2, 22. Deuteronomy 33, 22. And of Dan, he said, Dan is a lion's whelp. He shall leap from Bashan. Now, when you think about everything we've said so far and how evil the tribe of Dan is, is destined to become. You know, God knows your future and God knows your, your uh, boy, He knows where your, your family line is headed. So much of that depends on you this day. And you say, well, preacher, I didn't get saved till later and I, my family line's a mess. Well, your hope is now you're right with God and you can call on the God who can change everything. But God knows where your family line is headed. And what did He say? He said, Dan would leap from Bashan. Look at Psalm 22. Psalm 22. Psalm 22 is one of the great psalms where you have a prophecy of the crucifixion, or actually quite a detailed prophecy of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Boy, this is one of those things that prove how true the Bible is. You know, no man, you know, a thousand years before could ever predict all these details with any knowledge. And yet it's a proof that the Holy Ghost inspired these words because they came 
to pass just to the T in the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 1, Psalm 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Boy, you recognize those words, do you not? Jesus Christ on the cross, he cried out those exact words. Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Look at verse 6. And as you read these words, picture Jesus Christ on the cross. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head saying, boy, they did, didn't they? At the foot of the cross, they said these words. He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. Look at verse 13. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a raving and roaring, roaring. Boy, it's interesting. What animal did he choose? A lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. That happens in crucifixion. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws, and thou hast brought me to the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones. They look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. But be not thou far from me, O Lord. O my strength, haste thee to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling, from the power of the dog. Now watch. Save me from the lion's mouth. For thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorns. But look at verse 12. Many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. You know, that was a reference to the soldiers, the bulls. You know, he talks about the wicked in this passage, and he calls them dogs. You know what we say about a, a guy that's all muscle and he's a bruiser? You know, one of, the, one of the expressions that we have, we say, oh, he is strong as a bull. And the Lord said, many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of, is it any coincidence he said Bashan? Strong bulls of Bashan. And part of Bashan was located in the tribe of Dan. So all of this raises a question. Is this a blessing? You know how Deuteronomy 33 starts... And this is the blessing wherewith Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. Blessed? Boy, we saw it, you know, all the way through so far. We even saw it, you know, like with Reuben, where, where really so little could be said, and it almost seemed like the Lord hunted for something to bless. But every one of these, there's, there's been a blessing. But Dan, is this a blessing? Dan was one of the 12 sons of Jacob. Sort of like Judas. He was one of the Lord's 12. Was Judas blessed? And the answer is yes. Look at Matthew 10. Matthew 10, verse 1. And when he had called unto him his 12 disciples. So he, he, he's, he didn't say 11. He said 12. So Judas is standing there. He gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now the names of the 12 apostles are these. The first Simon, which is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother. James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew the publican, James the son of Alphaeus and Labias, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. Look at verse 7. What does the Lord tell him? Judas is standing right there. It, it, it doesn't say 12 were standing there and he gave 11 power. No, he, he gave it to all of them. 
Look at verse 7. And as ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely ye have received, freely give. Look at Matthew 13. Matthew 13. You know, the Lord spent a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with these guys, His 12. And He would send them out on preaching tours, and then they would check back in with Him, and they'd be together, and they'd travel together, and they would, they'd all be staying at the same place, and they would eat together, and boy, you just, the Lord would have private conversations with them, and, and Judas was always part of that. And in Matthew 13, Jesus speaks to his disciples, verse 10, and the disciples came and said unto him, Matthew 13, verse 10, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? So Jesus has been preaching to the crowd, and now once again, as so often happened, there's a break in the action. They pull away for a few minutes, and the disciples said, Lord, why are you doing this? You know, why are you always telling them stories? And Lord, some of them aren't easy to understand. Why do you do that? So the Lord begins to explain it. Look at verse 16. But blessed, that's blessed. Blessed are your eyes. Judas is standing there. Blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you, that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear and have not heard them. Was Judas blessed? He sure was. I wonder, you ever think about this, how many people Judas healed? I mean, these guys go out and they're, they're moving on a tour and he would send them out two by two and, and uh, you know, they'd get mobbed by a crowd and I don't know which one of the, you know, the crowd Judas paired up with. Maybe he was with Thaddeus or one of the other guys and, and, and you know, uh, Thaddeus would get pulled over here and Judas would get pulled over here. I wonder how many people Judas healed. I bet it was a bunch. I wonder how many messages Judas preached. They'd be together and Daddy said, well, I preached last time. It's your time this time, Judas. I wonder how many devils Judas cast out. I wonder how many heard the truth from his lips. You say, Pastor, you've got to be kidding. Oh, no. Don't you realize even in our day, there's been a multitude of those guys? that they went off the rails and they turned kooky as a bed bug. But 50 years ago, they preached the same gospel you and I preached. The devil can preach the gospel. wonder how many people heard the truth from Judas' lips. I wonder how many people came up and grabbed Judas' hand and said, Oh, Judas, thank you, thank you. We're so glad you came. Jesus said, many shall say to me in that day, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name cast out devils. And in thy name done many wonderful works. And Jesus said, and I'm going to tell them, I don't know who you are. I never knew you. Judas had tasted Hebrews 6. It says, talks about people that taste the powers of the world to come. Judas had tasted it, but he wasn't the Lord's. Judas had ability. Judas had not only ability, Judas had supernatural ability. But the problem with Judas was it never did anything in his heart. It never caused him to genuinely love God or to be born again. Was he blessed? He was. But you don't want that blessing. You know, there is a blessing that comes even to evil men. Now, don't misunderstand me. It is not God blessing their evil deeds, but it is God being kind to them. It is the long-suffering of God. It's God reaching out to them. It's the mercy of God. Jesus said, speaking of His Father, He maketh His Son, the sun up in the sky, He maketh His Son to rise on the evil 
and on the good, and sendeth the rain on the just and the unjust. But the problem with that blessing is it's not eternal, and it ends suddenly. It ends suddenly. Look at Job 21. Job 21. Was Dan blessed? He was. But you don't want that blessing. Job 21. I heard it this week. You know, it's just so crazy. You know, somebody said they were talking about a really, really bad situation. And they said, it's always so confusing because it seems like the person that's in the wrong always come out on the, on the good end of the stick. You know what that is? That's the blessing of Dan. Look at Job 21. The oldest book in the Bible is the book of Job. And look what it says. What, look what they knew way back then. Job 21, verse 7. Wherefore, that means why, do the wicked live, become old, yea, are mighty in power. Their seed is established in their sight with them, and their offspring before their eyes. Their houses are safe from fear. Neither is the rod of God upon them. Their bull gendereth and faileth not. Their cow calveth and casteth not her calf. They send forth their little ones like a flock, and their children dance. They take the timbrel and harp and rejoice at the sound of the organ. They spend their days in wealth. And in a moment, go down to the grave. Therefore, they say unto God, these are the people who have no use for God. Depart from us. You go to hand them a track. Oh, you know, I, I'm not interested. Oh, I don't have time for that. They had him way back then. Depart from us, for we desire not the knowledge of thy ways. What is the Almighty that we should serve him? And what profit should we have if we pray in him? We've already got all we need. Why do we need him? Brother Knox is down there in Deland, Florida. He said in, in his early days, he was knocking door to door. And he said uh, he was young in the ministry and, and he was poor as dirt. And he said, uh, he said, I had my, my best clothes on for door knocking. He said, I had a shirt and tie, but he said it, was, it, it wasn't anything to look at. And he said, I had holes in, in the bottoms of my shoes. And, and he said, I was in a real ritzy neighborhood. And he said, I knocked at this lady's door and it was a mansion. He said, she came to the door. And he said, you know, I'm James Knox and, and uh, you know, I pastor at the Bible Baptist Church in Deland, Florida. And, and we just want to, you know, invite you to our services. And, and if you have a minute, you know, I'll, I'll tell you about what Jesus Christ did for you. And she, she said with great disdain as, you know, as, you know, she did one of those. And she said, she just sort of looked around at her house and her, her Audi and her Porsche, and she said, young man, I have all I need. <laughs> oh, you got all you need, do you? Someday you're going to need more. Why should I serve God? I have all I need. Verse 16. Lo, their good is not in their hand. They, they don't understand. See, they think they did this. But God gave it. Their good is not in their hand. The counsel of the wicked is far from me. How oft, how often is the candle of the wicked put out and how oft cometh their destruction upon them? God distributed sorrows in his anger. You know what happens? They are brought into desolation. Boy, you know, everything's good and good. They got their money and they got this and they got that and they don't need God. You know, and, and, uh, and you know what happens? Everything's good. And one day they're walking down the, the gangplank of the wharf where their yacht is, and they fall down dead. Got a friend of mine, wealthy. He was from a wealthy Catholic family. Prayed for his dad for years. He said, well, my dad, he said he was rich. And he said uh, he was walking down the, walking down the wharf there. Going to his boat, and his heart stopped. 
Oh, they had everything. But God said, He said, I gave it to them. But God said, they don't realize in a moment they'll face me. Dan, he was blessed in life and he was blessed in evil. But you don't want that blessing. There is a blessing that you don't want. That's the blessing that lets you be treacherous. That lets you be like a snake. And you think you're okay because God is... I know Christians like this. Well, you know, preacher, God is blessing me. Really? There's a blessing that will let you reinvent Christianity. There is a blessing that seems to let you escape all the things that you've been warned about. There is a blessing that lets you do your own thing. There is a blessing that lets you come to church and ignore the Holy Ghost. But you don't want that blessing. You don't want that blessing. But then there is a real blessing. Look at Acts chapter 3. God blessed Dan. God said, Dan, you know what? I'm just going to let you do your own thing. Well, there's a, there's a lot of folks, a lot of, a lot of people that they, they'd really like to have that one. And there's a lot of God's people that wish God would just let them do that. But you don't want that blessing. Acts 3. In this chapter, a lame man has been healed. And Peter and John are at the temple at the hour of prayer, and Peter starts preaching. And in verse 26, you find these words. He's preaching to those Jews there at the temple. In Acts 3, verse 26. It says, Unto you, you Jews, first, God having raised up His Son Jesus, sent Him to do what? Bless you. How? In turning away every one of you from His iniquities. God says, I, you know, Jesus was sent to bless you. Is, is it the blessing that you want? He says, if you'll let me bless you, he said, you know what I'll do? He said, I'll turn you away from your iniquities. He said, that'll be the blessing that you'll treasure for time and eternity. And God says, I'll give you a bunch more on top of that. But he said, he said, but the blessing you want is this one. Is the blessing just sunshine and rain and health, and material things, and security, and love, and fun, and social life, and travel? No, it is more. Jesus says to you today, let me bless you for now and eternity. Let me turn you from your iniquities. We always quote that verse, and I quote it a lot, but I always miss one phrase, and I never mean to. But I always miss a phrase. Jesus said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Now here's how I usually quote it. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. But I missed a phrase. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. You don't have to turn there, but one last verse, Proverbs 10, verse 22. It says this. You ready? The blessing of the Lord. It says, don't get restless. Every time I say that, everybody starts shutting their Bible. It says this. The blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich, and he addeth no sorrow with it. 
His blessing. You know, it maketh rich. That, that rich isn't always money. It is always money. I mean, we, we would like for it to be, but um, it's not always money. You know, uh, you ever had somebody and you're, you're, maybe you're there at the house or, or, um, or somebody, you know, brings you this, this plate of fudge or these brownies and you take a bite and uh, you go, wow, that is rich. You know what that word means? Now, you and I know what it means, but, but by definition, it means having many desirable qualities. And the dictionary said, it gave us the example of containing plenty of butter and eggs and flavoring. Rich! You know, you can have whipped cream or you can have Cool Whip. Now, I like Cool Whip, I do. But, um, but you know, there's a big difference. There's a big difference. You know, real whipping cream is made from the 33% stuff. That's the stuff you drink about this much and your arteries start going. <laughs> and uh, you, you, you blend it up and, uh, in, and you add a little sugar to it or whatever. And, um, and you, th that's real whipping cream. And boy, there's a difference. You know, one is rich and one's just light and fluffy. You know, my, uh, and if you, if you bring a dessert and it's with Cool Whip, I'll eat it. I'll eat it. Um, my, uh, my wife's grandpa, he would always make fun of people that drank skim milk. Because back in the day, you know, when all the fad diets started coming out and, you know, they were cutting back on this and cutting back on that. And he goes, he'd hear about these people drinking skim milk. He said, if I wanted to add water to my milk, I'll just add water to my milk. <laughs> Rich! You know what God's blessing is? It's rich. You know what the other blessings are? They're shallow. They're, they're quick. They, uh, they might give you a little bit of satisfaction for a time. But they're not deep. They're not full. It's not vivid. The blessing of the Lord is rich. And He addeth no sorrow with it. The difference is... The Lord's blessing, it's a lasting thing. The memory of the just is blessed. And you know, if you choose God's way and, and you want His real blessing and, and not the other one, you want the real blessing, uh, He gives you something that it'll stick with you. You know, you'll come to the end of the road and if all you got is the other ones, you know what you're going to have? If you have Dan's blessing, you know, God lets you do what you wanted to do. You're going to come to the end and you're going to have a lot of regrets. You're going to have a lot of loss. You're going to have a lot of guilt. And you're going to have this sense that so many people have. I think a lot of God's people, and I, I realize death comes suddenly for some, but you know, there's a lot of people that all of a sudden they hit their final illness. And we're, we're seeing a lot of that right now. People hit their final illness and, and you know, it drags out maybe for months and you know, they're laying there and you know, they can't come to church. And they can't, they can't go door to door. And they can't go to the Bible reading supper. And they can't do a whole lot of anything. And you know what they're doing? They're just laying there. And they're remembering all the time when they could get out. And they're remembering all the opportunities they once had. And you know what they realize? Their life was empty. It wasn't rich. God says, I got a blessing. He said, it'll stick with you. It'll make you feel full. It's vivid. You can wrap your heart around it. And it will bless you to the moment you breathe your last breath and beyond. Which blessing do you want? Let's pray. Some of you in this room, you know, you're eyeballing this thing of just, just, just living, living the fun life. You know, you just, you just got this thing in your head that, you know, just leave me alone and let me do my thing. And you know what? God may, God may look down and say, all right, I'll let you do it. But I don't think you want that blessing.
You don't want where that's going to take you. You don't want where that ends up. You know, today you could, you could at least think about it, couldn't you? Couldn't you at least think about it? Say, you know what? I could go God's way. He promised it would be rich. I don't know about you, but I want, I want the rich side. Don't you? Only God has it. Lord, bless your people this morning. Please work. Please do, oh God, what I can't do. God, only you can do it. Only you can speak to the heart. God, would you, would you say amen in that heart, Lord? That, Lord, they're struggling with this. In Jesus' name. If God has spoken to you, why don't you talk to Him while the piano plays? You can be a Judas, but you don't want that blessing. Lord, thank you for your truth. And Lord, bless it to our hearts, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.